For the first shelves, I just want to go over some general shelf tips. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick resource review. Uh, as you've probably heard, UWorld is, is really the gold standard for all the shelves. Um, so I, I gave that one a, a 10 out of 10. The MBME Prags exams are very similar to the real shelf exams. So I'll definitely take one or two, um, for, especially given that this is your first shelf. So I would those two for sure I would do. Anki, I really liked Anki, um, but really it's it's not necessary. And same with Pastanas. These are all, the, the, really the only other two resources I'd, I would uh, recommend. But really you can do well on the surgery shelf with UWorld and the MBME Prax exams alone. The other thing you need that I want to tell you for the surgery shelf specifically is that this shelf has a lot of medicine on it. So um, we will be giving a medicine shelf review in two weeks. So I, I'd really recommend that you come to that one too. We'll cover a lot of cardio, palm, and renal for that, which is super high yield for the surgery shelf. Um, and then you've probably heard of surgical recall. It's it's good for the rotation, but not really as much for the shelf. It'll have like a lot of niche points that um, the NBMEs don't really like to go after, but sometimes your attendings will ask you about. Um, and then just going over the shelf breakdown for surgery. So this is a breakdown. I won't really go too much into it, but we should be covering most of it in the next few weeks. Um, and then here are the um, kind of basically what they call like your physician tasks. So it's basically what the question's asking you to do. So some of them are just based, a basic knowledge test. Um, a lot of it's diagnosis, literally what you do in clinic probably a clinic in the OR every day, managing patients, looking at exams. And a lot of it is, think of it as like presenting patients is what that part is. And then a lot will be what's the next step in therapy. So what drug do you want to give them? What intervention, especially, you know, this is a surgery shelf. So they're going to ask you when we should do surgery um, and then other management. All right. Um, so that's uh that's enough about the shelf. We'll just kind of dive right right into the content now, which is why you're probably all here. So starting with acute trauma. So I think everyone has to do a trauma night. And this is when you go to do your trauma rotation, this is kind of what I would pay attention to. So, and you can type in the chat for any of these questions. Um, so if you have a trauma patient, let's say, you know, like a level two patient and they're coming in, what's the first things you want to assess? It's also called the primary survey. Yep. Yeah, good. ABCs. So, in the chat too. great. Um, what are the ABCs? Airway. Right, nice. Good. Breathing. Circulation. Good. Okay. And then the ABCDE is sometimes um, what they'll say, and D stands for disability. E is exposure. So exposure, especially if there's some kind of poisoning, like an organophosphate poisoning, you want to remove other other clothes. Um, so, and usually that's why they bring trauma shears in the ER is to, um, watch for exposure. Okay. Uh, GCS score for intubation. Anyone know this? If you're less than blank, you should intubate. It rhymes. Yeah, good. Eight. So the way I always remember it, if GCS is eight, intubate. And the score was from three to fifteen. So, you know, one of the EM attendings told me they had a they had a resident once that said the GCS was zero. No, the GS, GCS the lowest score can be is a three, and it goes up to fifteen. And if GCS is eight, you should intubate. Good. And then here's the um, Glasgow Coma Scale GCS. Um, I won't go over it too much, but basically the, the motor response is out of six, and that can make you can make sense of that because you know you're the large component of your body is kind of like movement and muscles. Um, and then the eye opening response is four. And I remember that because that's kind of like um, the smallest part of their body in the GCS. And then the verbal is in between. It's it's out of five. All right. And I'll add a point too. I, I mean, being able to calculate it given a clinical scenario, I would say it was guaranteed to be on your shelf. I know I, ha I had a question on that. Also on some uh, on some UWorld questions, so it's a good thing to know. Yeah, and they usually make it pretty obvious, so yeah. I wouldn't stress over every little thing. But if someone comes in like, uh, and they're not responsive and they can't protect their airway, and th this will be a question on almost every shelf, the answer will be to somehow protect the airway, and that's intubation. All right. Um, oh, and I don't have this on the slide, but what's the preferred form of intubation? Oral tracheal. Yeah, through the mouth. Um, okay. 
So circulation. So if somebody has a brisk blood loss, what? how do you want to um, ensure circulation, aka fluid resuscitation? What do you want to do? What's first line? IVs. Good. What kind of IVs? Two large blood. Two large blood peripheral IVs. Good. And then what's second line? If you can't get two peripheral IVs in. This will come up good, intraosseous. This will come up on the PEDS shelf. But if you can't get peripheral IVs, you want to do intraosseous line. Usually the femur or tibia work, work pretty good. Okay. Now, more just about general trauma. What is a secondary survey? So That's exactly what it is. So after your primary survey, your ABCDE, you want to do a secondary survey where you basically just go from head to toe and you know, that's where you'll be pressing on the pelvis. You'll be saying, you know, you'll, you'll be establishing where other injuries are. And that will determine what imaging you get. All right. Uh, and then tertiary survey, what's that? <clears throat> tertiary survey is when you go back and you basically perform the secondary survey again at a later time. So you want to make sure you don't miss anything. And usually we'll complete it within 24 hours. So if a patient is admitted, we would go back and then do the tertiary survey before they could leave. All right? Um, acute trauma part two, C-spine. So if a patient has head or neck trauma, what should you do? Uh, kind of a broad question, but what do you want to protect? C-spine, right? Yeah. You want to do, have a cervical collar or uh, cervical stabilization. Uh, and so this is kind of, I word this question weird, but basically what, the, what do you need to like ensure before you can um, clear the C-spine? No uh, so what what things can't the patient be so i'll give you one example like they can't have like distracting injuries what are some other ones is, isn't there a mnemonic for this like NSAID? uh i don't know it but i'll just go over it um so they can't have so to, this is in general to clear the, the c-spine they can't have neck pain or like tenderness of the c-spine and they also have to be awake and alert. They, I mean, if they're passed out, it's really hard to assess, obviously, if they have a C-spine injury. And then they can't be intoxicated and they can't have distracting injury. So what do I mean when I say distracting injury? Yeah, yeah if they have like a femur fracture or something like that, if something else is broken, that's going to hurt. And then they won't be able to tell you really if they have pain in their spine. So there is an official criteria called the nexus criteria. Um, I don't know if that's the acronym you're talking about, but these, if they have these things, you cannot, um, you cannot clear the C-spine without imaging. So what happens if they have, uh, you suspect a C-spine injury? What do you do next? <clears throat> I'm talking about uh, imaging here. What's the best imaging for uh, C-spine clearance? Lateral neck. Lateral neck what? X-ray. Actually, no. The best imaging test is a CT scan of the, of the C-spine. Yeah. And then let's say somebody has a uh, high C-spine injury. Why can they have compromised respiratory status and be hypoventilating? Question about that real quick. Um, uh, yeah. Are you saying the go-to is CT and the most sensitive? Uh, because I had questions that was like, what's the most sensitive? And it was MRI. So... Do we have to like pay attention to that or should we just usually look for CT? Sensitive for a fracture? Or like, like spinal, uh, like, uh, so, um, injury. The, the, so the most that uh, you'd have to pull up the question, but usually for bones, we want a CT. Usually for fractures, the, uh, especially if you're looking for a cervical spine fracture, you want to do a CT. It's the, the most sensitive test at that point, more sensitive than an X-ray. So usually we just skip the C-spine X-ray and go straight to a CT. And an MRI. Is it like spinal cord injuries? As a Sp spinal cord injury is what? It's, uh, it's soft tissue, right? So then you'd want to do an MRI. But here we're looking for fractures. So we would want to do a CT. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then uh, just for future reference, if you can just uh, ask the questions in chat, I have Jackson reading the chat for me. So he'll just point out just it's better for flow. Sound good. Um, so getting back to the respiratory status, if you have a high C-spine injury, why can you have uh, depressed respiratory status? 
Think about C3 through C5. What goes there? Diaphragm. C through C3 through C5. Keep the diaphragm alive, right? Phrenic nerve injury. Keep the diaphragm. All right. So diaphragmatic paralysis. All right. Now this is kind of a, a niche one, but if you see this, um, what should you suspect? If they have battle sign, clear rhinorrhea. Thank you. Raccoon eyes. That's the periodontal ecchymosis. What, what would you suspect here? That's yeah, good. Basilar skull fracture. And what part of the skull does that affect? <laughs> it's the uh, petrous part of the temporal bone. And what imaging should you get if somebody has a basilar skull fracture, if you see these signs? Um, this isn't rocket science. It's kind of the whole point of the slide. Uh, cervical CT. Yeah. Yeah. Um, basically, when anybody has head trauma, you should think about uh, cervical spine injury and consider a, a cervical CT. If you you haven't had your ER trauma rotations yet, but um, if you have, you you probably see they we do a lot of cervical CTs and head CTs in trauma situations. Okay. I got it. Let's say a patient has a hyper, elderly patient with hyperextension of the neck, and they now have weakness of the upper extremities more than the lower extremities. What is this? <clears throat> central cord syndrome right and it, it tends to affect the um upper extremities more than lower extremities and it usually presents first with weakness and um later on with uh signs of upper motor neuron uh damage which would be like uh, hyperreflexia um okay imaging for this central cord syndrome this might be kind of answering what we talked about earlier MRI. mri good Okay, and then a really niche one, but something you should watch out for. If a 70-year-old female with a past medical history of rheumatoid arthritis, they ha suddenly develop um, hyporeflexia and weakness after intubation, what would you be thinking about? Uh, this well, is niche, but high yield. Very high I've yield. It, it comes up times. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is also found in patients with Down syndrome. Okay. All right, this is a good one to remember. So it is fracture in chat. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's atlantoaxial instability, which would be a dense fracture. <clears throat> so if you remember back to M and M, it's uh, what is it, like the atlas, um, and the axis. It's like C one and C two basically. Yeah. And uh, when you get an instability there, you can, after any any basically trauma, you can have uh, like hyperreflexia and, and muscle weakness. Okay. Next, moving on to BAT, blunt abdominal trauma. So 40-year-old 40 40 male, motor vehicle accident. Now they have abdominal pain. GCS is okay. Um, they have re rebound tenderness on exam, though, and their fast is positive for intraperitoneal fluid. Um, what's the next step? And their blood, they have pretty significant hypotension. What do you want to do next? Next lab. Next lab. Good. And then just a random question I found. How much blood loss, what percent of blood loss is needed for shock? I found like 25 to 30%. Yeah. And then when somebody has a lot of blood loss, um, we do something called the massive transfusion protocol. What is that? And when do we do it? Transfuse. Yeah, we transfuse. Good. What do we do? One to one. one to one. Okay, nice, Alex. So we do it when there's anticipated antis antis massive blood loss. So, you know, if basically anytime somebody receives more than four units of red blood cells, we'll initiate this. Um, and it's a one to one to one ratio of re packed red blood cells, platelets, and FFP. And the logic behind this is we want to normalize the um, clotting factors. Because when people have a lot of bleeding, you can be predisposed to DIC, basically trauma caught and trauma and massive blood loss can cause um, coagulopathy. So we want to normalize that with the, this ratio. You know, ideally we'd actually give um, like whole like blood, but we when you give blood, they actually separate it right away. So they don't do that. Okay, uh, what imaging you want to get for a hemodynamically unstable patient after BAT? <clears throat> Fast. Fast, good. All right. If uh, fast is inconclusive and they're hemodynamically unstable, what do you do? Like the only indication for the study. Yeah, you, you never, uh, you'll probably not see this, but it can be. Diagnostic yeah, DPL. Yeah, good. DPL. Um, 
And if they are hemodynamically unstable and after BAT, what, what imaging do you want to get? CT. CT. Good. All right. Just kind of random organ injury. So if you have BAT at the level of the, the bicycle handlebars, what kind of injury would you suspect? Pancreas. Yeah. Um, and then this is a delayed injury, but they can have blunt abdominal trauma to like handlebars or something. And then they're okay. And then a few days later, all of a sudden they have like uh, vomiting and they can't keep anything down. What should you be suspecting? Do I know hematoma? Yeah, good. Do I know hematoma? All right. If, uh, if there's a, uh, you see a perforated viscous and you see, see this on, um, chest x-ray, what are you suspecting on the left side? Diaphragm rupture. Yeah, perforated diaphragm. So you see the perforated viscous, and then you see the NG. Usually, you can see the NG tube, and that will be in the lungs where it shouldn't be, and that will follow the um, the stomach. So, yeah, you, normally your bowel is not in your lungs, so not not good. And it's usually on the left side. Why? <clears throat> yeah, the the theory is that your liver is on the right, and it's protecting your diaphragm from from rupture. So it's typically on the left side. Okay, uh, part two. So what is the grading scale for a spleen injury? Just like numbers. It's, uh, this is kind of dumb. I shouldn't have put this in. It's one through five. You'll see this on your rotation, though. This is, this is pretty common. Um, okay, if a patient is unstable and they have uh, inter interperitoneal in their fluid on fast after a spleen injury, what do you do? x lab. X lap, and what specifically are you going to do while you're doing the X lap? Splenectomy, yeah, you want to get rid of the source of bleeding. And then what imaging do you get if they're stable and you suspect a spleen injury? CT, yeah. Um, and then IR can sometimes do an EMBO with that. And then this is pretty high yield actually uh, with vaccination. So you're doing a splenectomy. What's the best timing, to, like the textbook timing for the best vaccination with the spleen injury after a splenectomy? It's actually technically two weeks, but usually we just give it in the hospitalizations just because we can't ensure follow-up. And which vaccines do we give them? Nice. Yeah, shin. So that's, I don't know if you've seen this mnemonic, but uh, it's shin. So haemophilus, influenzae, um, Neisseria, and then strep pneumo. All right. Um, so now with penetrating abdominal trauma, not really not as much with this. Really, there are only two types that they'll go after. It's gunshot wounds and uh, stab wounds. So let's go 40-year-old male gunshot wound at T8. Uh, you can't see the exit wound. What do you want to do next? Uh, Nothing. Yeah, usually just do X lap. So any entry wound below T4 involves the abdomen. Um, and then if it involves the abdomen, it's a gunshot wound, you basically need to do an X lap because you can't uh, explore it with like digital exploration. Um, in contrast to the next one we'll talk about. Yeah, that's a cool night. Uh, 45 year old with a stab wound, they're hemodynamically stable, no rebound tenderness. What do you want to do in the ER or what, what can you do? I don't know if they, people really do this in practice, but. Um, you can do a local wound exploration to see if there's peritoneal involvement in organ injury. Um, but if they have rebound tenderness or you see peritoneal involvement on your digital exam, what do you want to do? Um, just, yeah, excellent. If usually, like, uh, if you see peritoneal signs, surgery are usually the right answer. Yeah, unstable peritoneal signs. And perineal signs are like rebound tenderness or like the shake the bed test and rigid, um, the rigid jump abdomen. test. There's a bunch of them, but okay. Chest trauma, 35 year old, just had a meal review vehicle accident. They have hypotension, tachycardia, uh, chest pain, uh, wine mediastinum. And it looks like this. What, uh, what are you worried about? Let's say they have severe hypotension. Dissection. Uh, of the what? Aorta. Yeah, so traumatic rupture of the aorta. So not an aortic dissection because that's different, right? That's um, that's like hypertension, like an older male. Uh, that's like you're tearing pain to the back. This is a traumatic rupture, right? Um, okay, other trauma. This was in the news recently. Let's say a football player hit in the chest. Pretty light trauma. They have cardiac arrest. What is this called? Transfusion. 
it's not a contusion we'll, we'll get to later. It's um, modio portis. So basically it induces V-fib because they're hit and part of the cardiac cycle that's like prone to causing arrhythmia. All right, good. Um, what part of the heart is most commonly injured? Here. Yeah, what's, uh, what chamber? Right ventricle. Right ventricle, right. Um, right ventricle is the most anterior. Yeah, and why most anterior? Um, okay. Um, so let's say we have a patient with chest trauma, and then a few days later they have tachycardia, elevated JVP, hypotension. You give them a little fluid bolus, doesn't do anything. Um, and three days after, um, and in the hospital, what, what are you suspecting here? This was your actually. This is the contusion. Yeah. Um, and then what test do you want to get on this patient? This was a, yeah, this, I mean, you want to kind of get this with any time they have chest pain, but ec ECG, echotropes, you kind of want to run this gambit for most patients with chest pain in the hospital. So, but this patient in particular, you probably want to get an echo to assess uh, like wall movement and um, contractility. All right, good. Uh, part two, chest trauma. So, Six year olds fell down the stairs. He has left sided chest pain, and his x ray looks like this. I don't know if you can see it really well, but um, what is that? What am I showing you? I, I kindly pointed it out. Yeah, rib fracture at T7. So, what do you want to do to treat a rib fracture? Pain control. Yeah, pain control. Why? To prevent them from like hyper or hyperventilating and not that. Hyper or hypo? Hypo. Hypo, good. Yeah, you want to prevent... Atelectasis. Good. You want to prevent atelectasis, so you need adequate pain control. If you if you see an infection stem that, like, they're hypoventilating or, like, they're having a lot of pain, you need to... The first step will be managing that pain and then encouraging incentive spirometry. So you'll see that all the time in the hospital. That's, like, the little tube that patients have. And a lot of times, all the med students go and encourage them to breathe deeply in there. It's a good job. Yeah. Um, so flail chest, what's that? So, uh, the, okay, I, they're, they're doing this over here on the table, which, um, so it's paradoxical inward motion during inspiration. So normally when you breathe in, ribs go, rib cage ex expands outwards, so that's just, it's going in, and, and um, it requires three rib fractures, and it has to be broken in two spots in each rib. Okay, 60-year-old um, fell down the stairs, now he has left-sided pain, and, but he has, now you see decreased breath sounds on the left side, elevated JVP, he could have hypotension, hyperresonance on percussion. What is this? Pneumothorax. Good, pneumothorax, what's the next step? <clears throat> yeah, needle, needle decompression, so needle dracosentesis, Good. And then a special type of uh, pneumothorax. So if they have a sucking injury, how do you want to treat this? Just... Yeah, so you can, um, so the thing they'll go after on the shelf sometimes is that you can do yeah. um, partial occlusive dressing. So what you'll do is you'll, if there's like a square, you'll take three sides of it and then one side um, you'll leave open. So what that allows, what happens is when you are inspiring, the tape will kind of press down and when you expire, you can um, or exhale rather, you can force air out. Yeah, not expire, hopefully. Um, okay. Um, they have dyspnea, hazy infiltrates, local hazy inf infiltrates three days after trauma. What is this? Pulmonary contusion. Pulmonary contusion. Good. What do you want to do for them? It's nothing special. It's just supportive management. So, like pain control, um, continue to encourage them to breathe in. Uh, okay. Um, let's say this is this one's kind of high yield. Um, persistent pneumothorax. You you palpate crepitus over like the chest. Um, they have sub Q emphysema, and then they have a persistent air leak even after you insert a chest tube. What is this? Tracheal bronchial injury. Good. Yeah. Or sometimes you'll see a bronchial tree injury. Um, what do you want to do for them? What's the next step? Usually you'll consult palm, but what will they do? Not a surgery. Well, kind of, I guess. It's it, they do a bronch. So they'll bronch them. And then the other indication for a bronch you'll sometimes see is if there's like massive uh, hemoptysis, usually over 600 mils. How are we doing on time? Pretty good. Okay. Okay. Next, um, ortho. So basic ortho. I've got the I've got the two basic ortho on the right bench. You gotta be able to bench and you gotta play sports. 
Uh, but otherwise, just going over some terminology quick. ORIF, you'll hear this, it's open reduction internal fixation. So they'll like put in a plate and screws. Um, closure reduction basically means like it's not surgery you need to do in the ER, but you'll just um, reduce or, or you'll um, adjust the joints or um, bone to their normal alignment without doing surgery. Um, usually you'll want to get pre and post-op films for this. Um, intramedullary, IM nail is intramedullary nail. Um, and then a hemi is a hemi arth arth uh, arthroplasty. So basically you do like half of a uh, um, total hip replacement. Okay. More descriptors for ortho is open, is exposed to skin, closed, not exposed to skin, displaced, they're not aligned, non-displaced, they're aligned. Okay. If a fracture is open, what uh, do you want to do next? Clean it. How? How do you want to clean it? Do you want to put rubbing alcohol on it? Probably not. Not surgical agreement. Usually saline's okay. Oh yeah, I have an image for it. <laughs> uh, yeah, usually saline irrigation, and then you want to give them prophylactic antibiotics because it there's a really high risk of osteo um, myelitis with uh, open fractures. I read somewhere like tibia fractures with rates of osteomyelitis are like twenty five percent. So you usually give them prophylactic antibiotics. Um, okay, part two. So just going over this really quick. I know you all know this, but epiphysis metaphysis is like. Um, and then diaphysis is the, the long part. And this is a long bone. And then just to, you, I know you probably forgot this after m, &M but these are Salter Harris fractures. And you want to watch out for these in children, especially like the uh, type five, because they can cause what you'll see on the board exam is limb length discrepancy. And that's because they can affect the um, growth plate. I'm not going to go over them, each of them in detail, but okay. Then just going over some post-op um, trauma drama, but this can really happen with any um, any surgical specialty in the post-op period, except for this first one, really. Um, let's say patient after a femur fracture, you fix in the OR, and then a few hours later, they get uh, dyspnea, hypoxemia, altered mental status, then they get a petechial rash over the chest. What is this? Uh, that embolus. Yep, yeah. This is pretty specific to uh, ortho. Usually, this is kind of orthopedic injuries because you're exposing the bone marrow. Um, we'll have the highest ri risk of this. Uh, what's management for this? What do you want to do for them? Isn't it usually watch and wait, or you could do steroids, but there isn't good literature to support yeah. it? Yeah, exactly. And then sometimes you need to intubate these patients, but it's supportive. Um, okay. Uh, this one is the one you'll often get confused with the first one. Or I guess you would rather get confused with the first one or the second one, but this is super common. You'll get asked this on every show. 35-year-olds, five days after a fracture, they have unilateral leg swelling, they have dyspnea, hypoxemia, acute onset, pleuritic chest pain. Um, what is it? What do you want to do next? You'll see this literally every rotation, every day. Uh, what kind of thrombosis? Yeah, and what kind of imaging do you want to do? Because they, they have hypoxemia and dyspnea, right? What do you want to do for them? Ultrasound. Not an ultrasound. Okay. So what are we worried about with a DVT? PE, right? What, what's the imaging for a PE? Oops. Yeah, I'm not tricking you. It's a CT angio, right? Spiral CT. That's the best test with contrast. Um, and then should you get a D-dimer for this guy? Uh, I would yeah, there are actually two reasons not to get a D dimer with this guy. One, you don't usually you don't want to get a D dimer in the post op period, right? Because you they're already gonna have a high D dimer. Also, when there's a high suspicion for um PE, you don't want to get a D dimer because you're already gonna get the testing. All right. Um, how do we prevent um PEs in the post op period? What do we what do we do? You'll see this in like the note for every patient. It'll be like open oh, house. Yeah, yeah, good. So the preferred is low weight molecular heparin. That is the best data, um, but really any, and you know, just anticoagulation. Okay, what type of surgery is at highest risk for DVT? Yeah, I mean, if you if you had to guess, this is kind of like a test taking skill. I included it on this slide for a reason. Orthopedic, yeah, and I mean, you can explain that with two reasons, but you know, you're usually with the orthopedic injury, you have to have rest, right? So a lot of mobilization, mobilization. A lot of mobilization. So throwback, you guys still have to take step one. So what's Virchow's triad? Good. I provide a mistake. Good. Yep. Money. 
blood flow alteration, hypocoagulable state, endothelial cell damage. And guess what? In surgery, you have all three of these. So we're very worried about PEs in surgery. Okay, a neurovascular bundle on ortho patients, what does this consist of? Three things. It'll be on your shelf. You want to check this? They're not your shelf, but uh, I don't know. If I, I, I can't. Yeah, never mind. This is important. If you see a person with like a laceration or like a femur fracture or like a humerus fracture, what, do you, what three things do you want to check? Well, sensation. Like sensation. Blood, uh, perfusion. Yeah, good. So, um, Okay. Uh, motor, neuro, and vascular. So, all right. Next is a question. This will. This, I think this was literally on every show off I took. Um, Forty-year-old past medical history. Um, so they're uh, they. I was supposed to put alcohol use. Uh, two days post-op after a tibia fracture. Now they have seizure, like autonomic dysregulation, hypertension, tachycardia. DT. DT. Chair. Yeah. So they what's the next step? They often don't put alcohol in, in the... No, I know. I was, giving, I was giving them a little freebie. But uh, what's the next step? What do you want to give them? Unless you, This is what you give them everywhere but lacrosse. Uh, benzos, yeah. So in lacrosse, they give them phenobarb. But everywhere else, on the shelf, put lorazepam. Lorazepam is really well tolerated by the liver um, and um, has a pretty good um, half-life for treating uh, alcohol withdrawal. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I he literally threw in an extra asterisk just to include that it's uh, So it's very common. The other thing you want to know what the forms of alcohol withdrawal are. So you like you know there's like a form after 12 hours you can get like um, you start to be high risk for just like autonomic issues, hyperactivity, tremors, um, tremors, hallucinations. Right. But then and first. then al alcohol um, alcoholic. Uh, hallucinogenesis is like the first thing and then usually don't get delirium tremens until like 24 to 40 hours and delirium tremens is really bad because it's actually um uh it can be fatal yeah in like a, a good percentage of patients so you really want to watch out for that um okay i think i'm switching jackson so okay. we'll switch all right more ortho chat mod osteoporosis Classic question stem, 70-year-old female, postmenopausal, with a fragility fracture. And so, all right, I don't know why we have these slides organized like this, but what are some examples of fragility fractures? Wrist Distal radius. Femoral neck. Femoral neck, yeah. good. Hip, yep. Yeah. That's femoral neck. <laughs> And the last one, pelvis is a good guess, but uh, vertebral compression fractures, those are pretty, uh, more, when you see those, you suspect osteoporosis. So oh, this will come up on the shelf sometimes. What can you give patients inpatient after vertebral compression fracture that can help with pain and healing? If you haven't seen this, you probably won't know. It's uh, intranasal calcitonin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they use it it's, there's evidence behind it all right and then modifiable risk factors so things within the patient's control to uh that 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 leads them at risk to being osteoporotic osteoporotic, osteoporotic. <laughs> wait which which direction elevated it's actually the opposite low weight oh, so, uh, so and why is that why why does uh high weight protect you from osteoporosis? Because it's stress in your bones, so exactly there's another reason, hormonal region reason. Fat estrogen? Estrogen, yeah. So fat converts your um uh, adrenal androgens to estrone, which is uh bone protecting. Very good. And then just some other modifiable risk factors, low physical activity leading to low bone mineral density, um, low vitamin D and calcium, so uh, less mineralization, and then also alcohol and tobacco. These are all pretty common risk factors. Um, and then other drugs, aka other medications with risk of osteoporosis, I'm not getting at illicit drugs, but very common. What's like the steroids? That's like, that's the probably the most common one, and you'll see that one uh, come up very often, but uh, how about some other ones? These are pretty, uh, pretty random. They may seem random. They're good. 
Um, OCPs. OCPs. OCPs are actually protected. They should be protected. Why? Because of the estrogen component. Estrogen, yeah. Right. But some other ones include heparin, which I don't remember the mechanism. Uh, PPIs. I believe that's due to uh, decrease absorption. You have de so PPIs decrease your absorption of, of all of all divalent mm -hmm. cations, including calcium, mm -hmm. also magnesium. Uh, aromatase inhibitors because of decreased estrogen, uh, and then anticonvulsants. Uh, this is because of uh, we just talked about cytochrome P four fifty. So vitamin D is metabolized by the uh, uh, CYP four fifty mm -hmm. system, and so anticonvulsants are classically uh, inducers. And so you'll metabolize vitamin D quicker. So lower vitamin D, higher risk for osteoporosis. And the way I remember that is anticonvulsants. So that can include like um, phenytoin, carbamazepine. And the way I remember that is that carbamazepine is like a car and it revs up cytochrome P450. So any uh, drug in, um, metabolized by cytochrome P450 will be lower in the bloodstream if you're taking um, anticonvulsants. And if you like sketchy, they have uh, cars on their uh, sketch too for that. Yeah. Uh, all right, and then how to diagnose osteoporosis? What's classically, if you don't have a fragility fracture, what what do you? Uh, how else do you commonly? Super high yield on the shelf. What age? Ma maybe test? more in the ambulatory setting. That's scan. Exactly, DEXA. So bone mineral density scan, usually at age sixty five, um, and then on that uh, scan, if you have T scores of less than two and a half, which is compared to like the normal healthy bone density. Um, then this is the diagnostic. Um, and then treatment, what can you do to at least prevent or, or improve your bone mineral density? And the answer is not a referral to osteoporosis clinic. <laughs> yeah, no endo. Good, yeah. There are some drugs too. What drugs can we give them? Bisphosphonate's good. That's kind of the main one. Oh, you don't have my bone drug slide. That's okay. No, I took a but uh, so slide. in order, I'll do it from kind of like conservative up to more invasive with drugs. But calcium, vitamin D, classically give every every everyone this. Weight bearing exercise will help uh, increase bone mineral density. Bone drugs. I had a slide on this. I took, but I got deleted. It's on me. Uh, bisphosphonates, classically. So um, that is probably your highest yield one. Um, you can uh, denosumab. That's kind of like your. Uh, your, uh, what do you call it? Anti, uh, D denosumab is a, a rank L inhibitor. It's a monoclonal. It's a monoclonal. Yeah. And so it, it acts similarly to bisphosphonates. It activates, uh, uh, prevents activation of osteoclasts. Um, and then raloxifene, this is a serum, if you remember. Um, it's a bone, it's an agonist at bone. Uh, and this one, you, you want over tamoxifen Y. Calcium 206. Oh, and uh, negative risk for endometriosis and ovarian cancer. Right, right exactly. Not, so, uh, not endometriosis, uh, endometrial hyperplasia. Endo yeah, exactly. I, I, I <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll no worries. Uh, and then hydrochlorothiazide. This may seem weird, but why hydrochlorothiazide? Yeah, Good. so... Um, it, it, it increases calcium reabsorption in your kidneys. And so, like, say if you have... Uh, uh, if you have hypertension in addition to osteoporosis, this is like a perfect time to, to use it. That's where you would use this over, say, like starting on lisinopril right away um, because of the favorable um, secondary action. So, And then uh, they love to go after this on like every shelf. What are the side effects of like bisphosphonates? And denosumab. So what, uh, two. let's just go over some of them. GI side effects. Give me some GI side effects. Of, uh, but yeah, they can. Yeah. What's Diarrhea. the big one though? Yeah. Uh, GI upset, it causes really severe GERD. So you want to, so that's the other one. Right, Alex, we'll get there in a sec. So the big thing with bisphosphonates, if you prescribe uh, bisphosphonates for a patient, you should tell them to stay seated upright for 30 minutes because otherwise they get pretty severe GERD. Um, and uh, the other thing is they can cause, um, along with some other drugs, they can, they can cause a drug induced esophagitis. And Alex, we'll get to your point. They uh, can cause, uh, Osteonecrosis of the jaw. Yeah. That one's like, I don't know. They, that one's how you. They like to go after that one. I don't know why. All right. But yeah, a lot of GI stuff. All right. All right. Uh, nice oh, and then I threw on 
Uh, peak bone density graph. Uh, basically, once you hit 30, that's kind of when you hit your bone density or uh, peak bone density, and then you slowly decrease by, pretty sure it's a little under 1%. Yeah, it's like 1% per year. Per year, yeah. And so, yeah, cool pictures, Wikipedia. All right, Paige the resident. Paige Jackson. What do I got? What do I got cooking? All right. 35 year old, two days post op following open reduction internal fixation to be a fracture, suddenly develops extreme pain especially with passive emphasis on passive ankle flexion. What are you thinking? I, I heard compartment syndrome. Nice. Pain out of proportion to exam is also another one, uh, another uh, key term. Um, but yeah, compart compartment syndrome. So what should you do next? 645. Fasciotomy. Fasciotomy, exactly. So you want to do that ASAP. And so... Um, do you have it on here? Yeah, we do have it on here. So yeah, you want time to fasciotomy. Why? Because you want to keep the tissues alive. So it's all about uh, maintaining per, perfu uh, perfusion. And so in addition to that, we have removed constriction. So classically, you know, this will happen in a orthopedic patient. You might have to remove a cast or, or bandages or wound dressings or something like or that, to, or something. um, to decrease the, uh, decrease the pressure on the tissues. And so, um, Here's a good question. Should you obtain compartment pressures? No, it's not necessary. It's a clinical diagnosis, though I feel like sometimes this does show up on uh, 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 on shelves. But usually the answer is you should not get, the, especially in this patient. This patient especially, usually when they give you compartment syndrome, it's super obvious. They'll yeah. have like pain, extreme pain, then they'll be like, what's the next step? And the an there'll always be a question that answer choice. The fasciotomy is there. Yeah, that's put, the answer. You should say like emergent fasciotomy or take them to the OR surgery over, they'll have like tonometry, which yeah. the studies are already very equivocal. Even if you, like, even if you do it perfectly, um, it doesn't even always show compartment syndrome. So if you have a high clinical suspicion, just do a fasciotomy mm -hmm. because um, like, I think it's in one of the slides, but the, I don't know. It the was prognosis for um, compartment syndrome is actually dependent on time to fasciotomy. Yeah. So you don't want to waste time doing tonometry. But if they do tonometry, classically, it's like a delta-delta gap of like less than 30. Yeah. So you kind of have to play it on the fence, but I, yeah, it's just it's a patchy out. All right. Pathophysiology, we already kind of went through it. Basically, increased tissue pressure. Uh, increased tissue perfusion over perfusion pressure. All right. Physical exam. All right, so classically, there's early findings and late findings in uh, in compartment syndrome. W what are some of those early findings? Pain. Pain, exactly. Pain. A lot of pain. A lot of pain. Redness. Redness. Yeah, you can have some redness. I wouldn't look for it. I, I would say maybe the opposite because of perfusion. Maybe paleness. Dusky. Yeah, they can give you dusky. But yeah, so most of, most of the ones are, are pain, right? Pain on passive stretching. Those are kind of the first ones. You can get some paresthesias. But... This sometimes shows up on shelves too. It's the six Ps. You can also get some loss of sensation, paralysis, loss of pulses. That comes later, especially if you've missed the diagnosis. Um, but what did uh, if you guys get Eric Lee? If you've already had your uh, CBL, he he always goes. If you see the six Ps, you shouldn't be calling the patient. You should be calling your lawyer. Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Use that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He I, said, I, I specifically said for shelf review. So on the shelves, they will include these, and they and they may In have. Life, don't look for these if you're going to suspect a problem. And sometimes the shelves do have it. Is if it, like the patient has been here for a long time, inadequate treatment. They try to make it obvious. They, they'll make it obvious. How do you differentiate them from like acute lymphedema? Uh, that's a good question. Have that in here? Uh, we have yeah, it on yeah, this yeah. slide. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we have it on on this slide actually. Yeah, I remember putting that in. Yeah. All right. Uh, complications of uh, of compartment syndrome. <laughs> yeah, you can lose a limb. So loss of yeah, because of death of tissues. What's another class? It's a renal one? complication. Perfect. Rhabdo. All right. I'm gonna get my slides back. All right. And then there's your compartments for those are of you that are interested in. There what four in the leg? Yeah, there's four, which we talked about in radiology action. But uh, that's just for your information. They don't typically test that, um, but it, it's, it's, it's interesting to learn. That, you'll get pimped that a lot, though. They're always like, how many compartments are in like the leg? It's like, 
People want to say three, but it's four. So it's also good if you're doing a physical exam and you have tension in one of these areas. All right, so going to your question, very similar presentation, more with cardiac, uh, a cardiac past medical history. So you got AFib, acute onset, limb pain. You've got pallor, diminished pulse, weakness, pain with passive range of motion. What's the next step? It's a good question. Echo? What drug do you want to give them? I think I see Doppler. Yeah, Ooh, I got anticoagulant. Yeah, that's the first thing you want to do. So that's the first thing you, we want to do because you have a high suspicion for acute limb ischemia. Why? Oh. Exactly. An embolus from AFib. So um, especially high, high emphasis on like acute onset for any kind of embolus related disease because um, it's the dislodging of that embolus that happens really fast versus like a chronic. So like you can contrast this to like PAD um, where that's more of a chronic that's slowly progress. That'll be, next, that'll be week. next week. But I just made those slides. But we'll, we'll get there. But yeah, that's more of a cross like indolent. Chronic indolent process versus the acute onset. So, cool. All right, these sometimes show up. I'm kind of just going to blow through them. But hard signs on exam, distal limb ischemia, absent distal pulses, active hemorrhage, brewery thrill. These are all steps where you should want to do surgery right away. Those are signs of uh, high risk of rapid exsanguization if you don't uh, if you don't treat it. Whereas the soft signs, where you have more diminished pulses, so they're there, but not very strong. Unexplained hypotension, bony injury, known hemorrhage, neurologic deficits. These more require further imaging to further investigate uh, the vascular injury. And you have more time. You have more time, not quite as emergent. You can plan your uh, potential future uh, procedure. The best way to remember these is just memorize the hard signs. Uh, the soft signs, you can usually, you'll be like, okay, I should probably get imaging. Yeah, the, hard, hard, the, the soft signs are just hard signs, but light. Yeah. So yeah, I'd remember one, and then you, you, you'll remember the other. Yeah. All right. Hot, red, swollen joint. No history of trauma. Throw out some things that you're thinking of. What can cause this? You can press the space. Did you? Okay. Septic arthritis. That should be number one on your uh, differential. Great. Gout, I see in the chat. Good. What else? Transient Arthritis. synovitis. Someone's in rotation. Not bad. Good. Transient synovitis. I don't know if you'd have hot red joint. Uh, you that could present very similarly, can, but with pain. Yeah. And it'd be more bilateral. That'll be in the peds. Uh, peds week. But, but these are all good ones. Gout, pseudo gout, septic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, OA, and I threw hemarthrosis. Sometimes if you've got a hemophilic patient on there, uh, they might try to stump you with that. But what do you do next? Oh, geez. Quick. Oh, he had it ready. He had the answer ready to go. Arthrocentesis. Perfect. And uh, Good. I'll just kind of go through some of the findings. I mean, septic arthritis, since that's your big main concern, classically anything over 50,000. And this 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 shows up on pretty much every practice exam I've ever taken. Yeah, that's really high yield. Uh, but inflammatory, so like gout, rheumatoid arthritis. It's like kind of in the in-between stage. Like, yeah, it's kind of elevated white count, but not quite 50,000. Um, and then non-inflammatory, this is like osteoarthritis. Uh, it's less than 2,000, so. You took time out to make a, a separate Excel table. Hey, I, uh, that's hustling. I put in some work. Good man. I may have copied it from another table, but you know. Yeah. All right, so septic arthritis. Most common bug. Yeah. Staph. Staph aureus. Other bugs. Staph epidermidis, good. Classically in prosthetic, I see in the chat too, classically in prosthetic uh, prosthesis patients. So if you have like a, a joint replacement, what else? Uh, what if they have, they're like, they're sexually active? I see pseudomonas in the chat. That's a good one. Pseudomonas, less likely. What uh, if they're sexually active? It's like a sexually active female. See gonorrhea twice in the chat. Gonorrhea, good. good, yeah. Um, and then one, I, I'm just gonna put it out there. And the other ones are other are other uh, group base uh, staff. Uh, so group base straps. And then other gram negatives. So this is really important. Um, that we you don't hear about, but it's called the Haysack organisms. I don't know if you heard about yeah. them. Endocarditis. They're really hard to culture. That's like your Kingella, but 
that's why you will we'll get to the treatment, but there's a reason we add a certain antibiotic and it's a cover for these. Look in there. But in kids, uh, you want to watch out for King Gala. That's a uh, haystack organism that can cause septic arthritis in kids. And it'll be like, you won't have a gram stain. All right. What about risk factors for septic arthritis? <laughs> Who's more at risk? Like a sickly, like a people with many comorbidities. Comorbidities, yeah. So immunocompromised, that's a good one. So any any infection risk. Uh, bacteremia, commonly this is hematogenous, hematogenously spread. And then hardware, I see in the chat, good one. Abnormal joints. Hardware. So anytime you have damage to a joint, OA, RA, um, that leads to increased risk of uh, of infection. All right, and I'm going to go through this because I. We already had someone put it in the chat, but next up after synovial fluid analysis is gram stain and culture just to see what you got. You can uh, target your treatment, but before your results come back, what are you, what are you gonna do? Yes. Antibiotics, empiric, and what, what are some of those empirics? Which two in particular? Yeah, what, what are your empirics? Bank? Yeah. One more, Alex. You can uh, so. Sex triaxone, yeah. Sex is the one they'll give you. Yeah, so Vanco and Sex Tri. Um, and, and this is going for, just in case there's other gram negatives, that'll give you some coverage. But Vanco, because you're most concerned for staff. Zosin works too. That's uh, That'll cover gram negatives. That's Piptazo. Yeah. Yeah, Pip yeah Piptazo. That'll cover it. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, and then also, uh, you, the other treatment too, you want to flush it out. So you got an infection, you want to you want to have source control. So irrigation and drainage. You want to talk about osteomyelitis clip over here? Uh, I don't know. do I talk about it later? No, I think about taking it. We can save it. It's like a point ten years. All right. So shoulder pain in the acute setting. What are what are some? Uh, actually, I didn't put it out this way. So we got a twenty year old athlete tackled, falls on his shoulder. All right. And, we're, and this is going to be our vignette for the next like three scenarios. But patient one tender over the AC joint, positive cross body adduction test. No muscle weakness. I think I just include the whole thing. Let's see. Okay. Suspected diagnosis. I see separation in the chat. AC joint. Yep. So I guess to explain the cross body ad adduction test, this came up like once. When you when you cross your body like this, it increases the space in the joint, in the AC joint. And so that'll cause some more pain. Um, and so that's why you do that. Uh, diagnosis is classically with x-rays. I mean, anytime you suspect pretty much any injury in, in the MSK system, you're going to get x-rays first. Mm -hmm. And then treatment, what do you do most often? Depends on the degree. Depends on the degree, but most often, say it's mild, mm -hmm. support up here. So you can get a splint, a, a sling, um, and surgery, as we said, as it's a, if it's a higher degree. All right. And so next scenario, same patient or same vignette, 20-year-old athlete, tackle and falls on his shoulder. But now this time, this patient's arm is held in adduction and external rotation and now has some shoulder numbness. Case dislocation of the pinched axillary. Yeah, axillary nerve injury from a, did I put this on here? From a dislocation is what it's supposed to say. From excess of abduction and external rotation uh, force. So classically like this. Um... Diagnosis, usually clinical. You'll do x-rays to rule out other injuries. Um, and then treatment, what do you do next? Get it back in. Get it back in. Reduction. And that and that is classically by distal traction, so you just basically pull the arm down. And the earlier the better, before the muscles are, are too tight. All right, and then just some other things. I don't know. If, okay. Um, there... Question. So x-rays in terms of like a suspected sort of dislocation, is there ever a situation where x-rays have the right answer or is it always just going to be like clinical diagnosis next step is reduction? No, you should do an x-ray. Uh, yeah. No you should I, do an x-ray to rule out other, like if it's in case it's fractured or something like that okay, too. Right. Remember what I said in the beginning too, usually when you do a closed reduction, you want a pre and a post fit. Pre and post. So yeah. you want to get an x-ray. Sure. Yeah. And you're, you, I mean, x-rays are pretty non-invasive, so... You know, usually I consider x-rays more. The reason you wouldn't put an x-ray is if there's something like really insidious, like something really bad going on, you want to get, a, you know, higher, like a CT for sure. So, but 
And x-rays are good for ortho issues usually. And I'll just put this up on the slide just so you can see it too. Sometimes, it's, I mean, this came up in a thing in New World, but bank card and hill sacks fractures, basically all you got to do is look for them. It's from the shoulder getting banged around, hit some bone, and um, and yeah, that's why you do an x-ray is to see associated fractures. So these are kind of the things you're looking for. The other thing with the shoulder dislocation is it puts you at really high risk for getting another shoulder dislocation. I don't know if anyone here has dislocated their shoulder, but... And that's true for any ligamentous or joint injury. If you've dislocated it once, you're more higher likelihood of dislocating it again. So shoulder, knee, ankle. But for those with, with ankle sprains, you guys, you guys know. Patellar dislocation is pretty common in kids, actually. If you want your pizza rotation, we'll probably talk about this in the pizza. Uh, I, I have that. I have that. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about that then. And then, uh, so anterior uh, subluxations of the AC joint are the most common. Posterior, you can sometimes see following a seizure, and that does come up sometimes. But that, like, it's a very rare. Uh, mechanism uh, for this injury because it uh, requires an adduct and uh, internal rotation. So, all right. Uh, let's see. All right. Same patient, 20 year old athlete, tackle and falls on the shoulder, but this time there's swelling, erythema, tenderness and over the anterior shoulder. X ray shows clavicular fracture. All right. So, I told you what what it's uh, <laughs> what's the diagnosis, but uh, what what part of the clavicle is most commonly fractured? Middle portion, exactly. And and how, where does the uh, the clavicle move in comparison to the rest of the shoulder? This one's kind of hard. I don't know how to ask this. How, or how, the, the muscles pull the parts of the clavicle. Uh, I'm just going to put it up there. I don't know how to ask it. Um, the most common displacement pattern is that the deltoid will pull the distal part inferior, inferiorly and laterally, whereas this uh, sternocleidal mastoid will pull superior medially, which I do have a picture coming up uh, after this one. But this sometimes comes up. So just know that the, like, the muscles will pull the bone in, in certain areas, and that's how it will uh, appear on x-ray. Uh, treatments with a sling, and it, obviously it depends on the degree um, of injury, but you may it may need surgery. Um, and then classically, complications include... Uh, the subclavian artery. So this, let me see, what do I got next? Subclavian artery is located right below. And so you can have a, a bone fragment uh, nick the artery and you can get uh, hypotension. So that should be high. If you see hypotension with a clavicular fracture, you should suspect a subclavian artery injury. Can you call that to um, me Yeah. And so, and then I, I don't know what I was trying to do here. Humeral neck fracture complications. Um, classically, uh, think of, of your, um, of your axillary nerve. So classically up in the, uh, up by the top of your shoulder, you also have your anterior and posterior circumflex humeral artery up there too. So, um, I don't really know. It's kind of a random fact what I put on there. All right. We'll keep moving. All right. So thumb, we got, we're moving on to hand and wrist. Thumb pain and anatomic snuff box following a fall on an out, uh, outstretched hand. Scaphoid. scaphoid, good. Scaphoid fracture. And what kind of imaging uh, do we, we typically do? And what's kind of like the, the asterisk by it? Sure. X-ray. And yeah, what, what, why, am I, why am I hesitant on that? Or, or why am I putting asterisk by it? Close. It's classically negative. So th these fractures are, are notoriously hard to diagnose. And so... E, with this clinical scenario, I would still have a high index of suspicion. So you, I would repeat this in two to three weeks. And why am I very, like, what, what's one reason to be suspicious of this? What kind of complications can occur? Necrosis. Avascular necrosis, good. And non-union. So, so uh, the retrograde uh, blood supply um, to the scaphoid is, uh, that can get disrupted with this injury. And so there's a very high rate of avascular necrosis. And the treatment is just cast, so immobilization, and you can uh, you can pin it if you need to. And you want to uh, treat uh, even like when you have a clinical suspicion, you want to just give them casting, mm -hmm. even if the X-ray is negative, just give them the spike of uh, cast, and then bring them back in a few weeks. All right. So now we got a postmenopausal woman, also falls, now has wrist pain. We talked about this earlier today. What's uh, what's the most likely diagnosis? 
Radius. Exactly. So your your high suspicion for osteoporosis and distal radius fracture is very common. We have collis fracture on here. This is a, a, a the most common probably subtype of the distal radius fracture is where you just have the dorsal uh, dorsal displacement. There's also this like fracture. yeah, exactly. All right, and the treatment. Uh, in, if you do an ortho rotation classically on trauma, like this comes in every day, uh, you'll go down and you'll do close reductions. And so you'll, you'll put the wrist back and then um, surgery is usually reserved for, for very bad fractures, but you usually don't need to. Split it. Yeah, usually it's just splinting. So close reduction followed by mobilization. All right. And then this one, I just think it's funny. Patient punches wall now has to form fourth and fifth knuckles diagnosis. Classic. Punch fist. Punch yeah, fist. There's another name for it. Boxer fracture. This one shows up. It's the uh, fourth and fifth minute. But it's the fourth and fifth. Yeah, exactly. Cool. And then I just point out the anatomic snuff box on your distal radius. All right. Fingers. So you've got forced hyperextension of an actively flexed DIP joint. Patient can flex their MCP and PIP, but not their DIP. What finger is this? Blank finger. Yes. Finger. Jersey finger. So this one's Jersey finger. Now the opposite. Force flexion of an actively extended finger at the DIP. Which finger is this? Oh, I got Jersey in the chat. That's good. Mallet. Mallet finger. Mallets. All right. And then non traumatic progressive pain, clicking, catching, locking of the digit. This is probably the most common one. Nice. Trigger finger. Good. All right. And then uh, you got an abscess at the end of the, of the finger pad after a penetrating injury. It's red swollen. Felon. You got a felon. Nice, Bobby. That was quick. They were ready for that one. Yeah, that was good. They're like predicting our questions, though. All right. Dramatic hip. Postmenopausal woman with ground level fall and shortened externally rotated hip on exam. Diagnosis. Shortened externally rotated. Good. Femoral neck fracture. All right. And the treatment. Urgent surgery. I, I got urgent surgery. Not quite traction. It's broken. Usually not traction, yeah. But uh, surgery, and it's in, in what time frame? This one comes up. THA, total hit. Six, Six hours. Six hours, two to 12 hours. Within 72 hours. Yeah, the data right is kind of like within 72 hours is the best outcomes. But basically, if patients with uh, hip fractures have worse prognosis across the board uh, going forward. And and also keep this in mind because it's not super urgent because you can't you do have time to optimize the patient if they have other uh, other injuries or comorbidities that could impair surgery. That one comes up sometimes. Maybe we should go over that. All right, and then uh, complications of a femoral neck fracture. Go over which one. Being in the chat, good. Us and then the other, other one too for really any orthopedic complication or any injury is DBT. So, especially with hips because of uh, you're not walking. So, all right. So, motor vehicle accident with a shortened and internally rotated hip held in flexion and adduction. Posterior, Posterior hip dislocation. Great. So, internally rotated versus externally rotated. Good. And the treatment. This might be uh, what you were getting at earlier. Yep, reduction. So this one, you get radiographs first, and then you get, and then you do reduction within six hours to reduce risk of ABN. Good. Nice. All right, and then uh, complications of the posterior hip dislocation. There's a lot of stuff there. Uh, I would say with arterial injury, yes, you can get ABN.
And then classically, you got a lot of nerves around there. So sciatic nerve, you'll get, you can get sciatica. So the, the radiating pain down the leg and buttock, um, and then labral, labrum tears and then arterial injuries. So yeah, those, those are all pretty classic. And then I also included this one on here, anterior hip dislocations, not very common. Um, but, but if you have, if you can abduct and externally rotate your hip very hard somehow, that's how you could do it. But they, these are very, these are not very common. And then just some examples. All right, knee trauma. Motor vehicle accident, x-ray shows posterior knee dislocation. What is, what is your first step in evaluating this patient? Think about what's uh, in the popliteal fossa. Yeah, what are you like? What are you worried about? Like, what what can get hurt here? That's life threatening potentially. Vasculature. Vasculature. Good. So next up is a vascular exam. You want to check pulses. You want to see, you know, is it pale? And then an ABI is a, is a good idea here. And can someone remind me what an ABI is? Like index. Yeah. How is that? Like, what's kind of the general steps? Yeah, and ankle brachial index. So usually it's the arm. They'll compare the arm to the leg, and it's a ratio exactly. And so, um, I guess we'll get there. But uh, I guess once you've done that, you've ruled out injury. Uh, what's your next step in management? Put it back in place. Reduction. Good. And this is because the popliteal artery is becoming injured. And if your ABI is less than 0 0.9, this is when you're um, this is when you're considered your concern for that uh, arterial injury. So CTA and vascular consult to evaluate for further uh, workup for the injury. Um, other complications to a posterior uh, knee dislocation. So we have vascular injury, uh, vascular complication. What other? Big categories. Yeah, just, ligamentous. What could. nerve runs along the lateral knee? Like, common, common fibular, common peroneal, same thing. So you can get that classic uh, foot drop. Good. All right, next patient. So a patient suffers direct blow to the anterior knee and now cannot extend knee against gravity. This is a, this, this is like the classic scenario. What bone they fracture? Telefracture, good. So yeah, if they can't extend, extend their knee against gravity, that's classic for patella fracture. And this is just demonstrating what an ABI is. Very good. All right, rapid fire. All right, unstable knee. We're gonna go through some knee exam maneuvers. So anterior drawer, Lachman's, what is this test? ACL. Good, ACL. Posterior drawer, PCL. Valgus, you got valgus laxity? Perfect. Ferris laxity? Lateral. Good. Now you, you are doing a McMurray's and you internally rotate and, and provide varus force. Meniscus, which, which side? Good. And externally rotate? That's medial meniscus. Good. All right. So common mechanisms of ligamentous injuries. What are what are some maybe like what's a classic scenario? Yeah. Like twisting. Pivoting, twisting, sudden deceleration. So, like, very uh, like change of direction. All right, diagnosis. What do you what do you use to uh, diagnose these? What's I heard MRI. Very good. And then treatment mostly is is activity modification, analgesia, and surgery. Um, all right, signs of meniscal tear. What's kind of a classic scenario? On physical exam. In the chat, I see clicking, locking, catching, reduced range of motion. These are all these are all very classic. So if you see these on exam, you gotta think meniscus tear. And then treatment usually is mostly um, conservative in those who are older, not fit for surgery. Um, otherwise, you can do surgery to repair it. Cool. All right, special fractures. So these special fractures actually also happen to be all pediatric fractures. So if there's a, a bending stress that causes an incomplete fracture partially through the width of the bone, what kind of what kind of fracture is this? Green stick, nice. All right, what about an axial force that causes a, a simple 
buccal fascia of the cortex. Not quite. This one's a torus fracture. And then the last pediatric fracture that I would commit to memory, you got a young kid uh, and they have a twisting injury. A twisting injury that causes a spiral fracture. What is this classically called? Not that classic. I didn't know. This one's a toddler's fracture. All right. And so here's the example. Here's a green stick fracture. So this is like a the force is coming from this side. You got this bending stress, right? This side is the incomplete fracture. This side is the fractured side. Here's the torus fracture. It's like an axial force coming from this side. Hopefully you guys can see my cursor. Uh, yeah, we can. But then you got the uh, buckle fracture right here. Nice. Yeah. All right, upper extremity. So last slide. Last slide. Last slide, guys. All right, so three-year-old yanked by the arm, holds arm close to the body and elbow flexion pronation. What's most likely? What's that? Nice. Nurse maids, also known as radial head subluxation. What? Why do you young kids, <laughs> typically less than five, have this? Or, or why are they prone to this? What's not fully formed? The blank ligament. Thingy ligament something. The underdeveloped thing. I'll take it. So it's the annular ligament. Yeah. So that's that's not fully formed yet. And so that you, you're prone to popping out your elbow because of that. So if they're classically kids get swung around or yanked off the sidewalk, that's kind of the scenario you'll see this. Under five. Uh treatment. Obviously, you put it back, but how do you put it back? There's kind of two two methods. They made a song for it. Is that really? No, it's kind of a joke. Hyperextend. Hyperextend? It's uh so hyperpronation. I like that. That's the one. It's hyperpronation and or supination with elbow flexion. So either or that's how you can pop yeah, it back. Look, 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 look what movies did. Yeah. I saw this on Twitter. Oh, yeah. That's funny. Try it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got the spirit. <laughs> All right. Next scenario. Five year old Fouch injury, obvious deformity at the distal humerus. X ray shows a fracture. What kind of fracture? What do you call this fracture? <laughs> yeah, humerus. So supracondylar fracture. Uh, and this this classically occurs in young kids. It can also occur in uh, uh, postmenopausal women as well. Uh, complications. So what are, what are some things that are close to this region of the body? Median nerve, good. I like that. And, and so we got nerve. What other big category? Brachial artery. Nice. All right. And then you can also get the radial nerve if it's, if it's laterally. But yeah, median nerve and brachial artery are the top two, I would say. And then, uh, all right, this is our last question. Complication of a brachial artery injury. So this will be like a patient that had like some kind of ischemic injury. So like a brachial artery injury. And then a few weeks later, you'll like see this. This is super specific, but you'll see it on uh, boards sometimes. They like look like this. They'll yeah. come in like this. They, they have difficulty moving their arm. Does anyone know it? Sometimes you'll see this on. This can be a, like a result of like. It's kind of a step one. Too. But this one's Volkman ischemic contracture. And so classically when the brachial artery is disrupted, uh, they can develop this. As Mike said, you get ischemia from, from the disruption. And then this causes this claw contracture like uh, deformity called Volkman ischemic contracture. All and right. here we have a supracondylar fracture. Nice. Any questions? And that's all we have. And then uh, did anybody, if anybody uh, is here that didn't RSVP, I, I want to send out like a survey after this so that we can, I want to have like a big session on the 29th before you guys take your shelf for like everything. And I want to have food. So I want to give like a feedback form. Well, I didn't. Do we have a feedback form for this one? We have one. Yeah, okay. I have it. I want to, if anybody is uh, in the chat that didn't RSVP, just like throw your email in so I can send you a form. Otherwise, if you have any questions, put it in the chat. And then uh, you get to just go. housekeeping things next week, we'll do a surgery over uh, mostly the GI stuff. So we'll do a GI review next week. Same time, same place. Um, yeah, next week is GI, vascular, um, derm, um, endocrine. Um, I think that's about it. That's next week? That's next week. I just made the slides today. I just finished them up. All right. Um, any other questions before we go? And then next week, I might invite the medicine folks, too, because it's pretty high yield for medicine. We'll be the same Zoom link. I think so. 
Cool. Anything else? I don't think so. All right. That's all we got. Thanks for coming. Will the slides be sent out? Say it again. I'm not. I'm not sure yet. I have to. I have to just talk with the like course coordinators and stuff. We'll we'll talk with our uh, admin person about where these recordings go and stuff. Yeah, we've got a guy on it. We've got a guy though. It's all being recorded and stuff. So we'll have it. Hopefully, we can like get it up on the shelf for sure.